tell if that works. All right, there we go. Uh, OK, so we'll start off today first by introducing the lead TA, Mosin. Mosin, why don't you stand up, give like a nice princess wave to the class. Uh, so this is Mosin. His email and his office hours are on the syllabus. He's also in charge of the submission system. So if you have questions with that, feel free to talk to him. Do you have anything you want to say? No, just start early for your project. All right, good. Yeah, start early. It's not going to be easy all the time. I like that. Cool. Uh, any questions before we start off today's lecture? No, everybody wants to get right into it. All right, I like that. All right, so we left off on Monday with talking about programming languages and how they work and how we're going to look at how a program can actually take raw bytes from a text file or whatever and interpret that and perform some kind of computation. Because uh, that's really what we care about here. And so the first thing we're going to talk about here is how do we do that first step? How do we take those bytes and to turn them into something that a computer can actually try and understand? Um, so we want our programming language needs to have a clearly defined syntax, right? So why might that be nice? Well, somebody raised it slightly. There you go. So it can be parsed. It can be parsed by who or what? A program, right? So we're going to write a program that's going to parse it. We want the syntax to be well defined so that uh, the computer can parse it. We need a non -ambiguous Sorry. Yeah. We need a non -ambiguous kind of wizard. Yeah. So uh, that we as humans, right? So it needs to be unambiguous in the sense that when we write something, we know that the compiler or the interpreter is going to interpret that exactly as we specified, right? Because otherwise. <laughs> Uh, we may write one thing, but it interprets it something else, and then our program either crashes or worse, does the wrong thing, and it's a heart monitor, and now you've just killed someone. Yeah? So that we know what can be done or what can't be done? Yeah, so we know what can be done, what can't be done. We know what a, a valid program looks like, right? So the syntax defines that. So, yeah, it's part of one of the first things, right, when you learn how to program in a programming language, you learn the very basic syntax. Uh, if it's Lisp, you'll see parentheses all over the place. And if you're not familiar with that, maybe you terrified. But if it's C, you learn that every line has to end with a semicolon. right? That's part of the syntax. And so these things need to be well defined. Um, and also so that the compiler, right? so that the compiler writer and the compiler itself can understand programs written using this syntax and can enforce that syntax to make sure that that program uh, is valid. So if we think of it kind of like a system, right? So we think of it from that example I used on Monday of like a series of components. So the input here is a series of bytes. And what we want to do is we want to get from this string, this sequence of characters of raw bytes to some kind of program execution. Uh, so the very first step here, and that's kind of what the lexer's job is, is we need to assemble this string of characters into something that a program can understand. And the output here is going to be a sequence of tokens. So you can think of the, this as kind of a high level, like rather than, maybe I have an example on the other side. So yeah, OK, so in English, right, we have an alphabet. So I hope everybody here can speak some English so you understand what I'm saying, understand the slides. Um, so in English, we have an alphabet, right? So what's the alphabet of English? It's kind of, it's easy stuff, like kindergarten stuff, right? Or later, if your English isn't your first language, anybody want to? I promise I won't make fun of you. Huh? The alphabet. The alphabet? Yeah. So what? I mean, what kind of let's say letters or what? What makes up the English alphabet when you think about that? Uh, twenty-six letters A through Z. Yeah, twenty-six letters A through Z. Is that it? Well, there's also alphabet uh, numbers. Zero, zero through nine, and then the zero through nine. So the, the numerals are the yeah, and then the various symbols, question mark, period. Right, and then the punctuation marks, and then all kinds of crazy other types of punctuation marks that aren't used so much, like a long dash or a shorter dash, uh, which is if you get into doing a lot of writing, you end up knowing the difference. And um, So yeah, we have 
you know, question marks and exclamation points and periods and all these kind of, at least in English, and this is what we're going to focus on, right? We think of them kind of as one letter or one tiny symbol, right? Um, but is that how everyone here thinks about and process? So I should start off, I'm not, obviously not a linguist, right? So, um, you know, we're talking about things at a very high level here. So does anybody here think about things in the form of letters? Like when I'm speaking, are you processing P-R-O-C-E-S-S? -S? Okay, that's processing, like, I'd say no, right? Well, I guess hopefully nobody's doing that. If you are, that's pretty impressive, actually. So we don't think that way, and so it's weird because we think in abstractions, right? So what are the abstractions on top of the letters that we think about in English? Words. Words, yeah. So we group letters together to make words. Um, so we have like a higher abstraction than just the raw alphabet. So we have words, um, but how do we know if a word is valid or makes sense? If I just say, I was gonna make up some word, but that'd be really weird. Blah, 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 right? Like that, you may be able to make characters from the sounds that I just made, but is that a word? Uh, somebody, yeah. No, no, sorry, behind you. Yeah, like a dictionary, right? So yeah, so all the words are defined in a dictionary. Um, this is where we, the kind of the metaphor breaks down a little bit, right? Because English is a constantly evolving, changing language. So there'll be words that I say and you understand that are not exactly in a dictionary. Uh, maybe urban dictionary is the new, better way to think about that, but I just probably don't want to go there, so. Um, and then, so we have the words, right, at a high level, but then what's, so, but words are just words. Right? Are they all identical or all the same? No. no. Right? They're at, we've kind of split them or categorized them. So what are some of the categories of words? Somebody from like the middle row. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe nouns as well. Yeah, so the different types of words, right? So like where they are and where they're used in the part of the speech. So nouns, verbs, adverbs, uh, articles, all that kind of stuff. And then we obviously, well, maybe some of us do when we're writing, but we don't just write or speak just words, 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 right? So we kind of group those together into a higher level being sentences. sentences. Yeah, exactly. And then sentences into paragraphs, paragraphs and paragraphs into everything else. Everything else. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, it could be anything. Paragraph. So essays, letters, uh, different types of. Um, I don't know, what other kinds of types of writing would there be? Abstract. What was it? Abstract. What? Abstract. Abstract? Oh, yeah, like an abstract of something. Uh, like a paper. Yeah. Uh, anything else? I don't know. A poem, maybe? And maybe that actually doesn't fit because it doesn't always have sentences or paragraphs. But uh, anyways, the point being, you can kind of think of it as this series of abstractions, right? So at a very high level, you just have some piece of writing that's made of some paragraphs, and paragraphs are made of sentences. Sentences are made of different parts of speech that have certain rules, and those parts of speech are composed of words, which are composed of letters. Make sense? This is not like a super shocking surprise to anyone, right? <laughs> well, at least, I mean, even if you... If it's been a long time since you've studied like raw English grammar, you at least internalize this stuff, right? Good. Okay, so we actually use the very similar concepts when we talk about how to analyze and how to define the syntax of a language and how to think about and understand a programming language. Uh, so we also have an alphabet in a programming language. So what would be maybe the symbols or alphabet of a a random programming language. What was it? Something? Yeah. The reserved words. The reserved words. No. Close. Yeah. Parentheses. Parentheses. Yeah, exactly. Parentheses, character, like, like individual, so ASCII characters. So actually kind of similar to English, right? So we have the lowercase letters, uppercase letters, 0 through 9. Uh, most of the punctuation. You can see we kind of have more characters here than maybe in English, right? I don't know. I probably very rarely use a curly brace when I'm emailing or 
especially when I'm talking to somebody, I'm not sure how you would do that. Um, but in programming, right, that's actually a very handy and nice construct. Uh, but it's just a byte, right? It's just an ASCII character. Um, and the, yeah, the angle brackets are right a lot more important in programming languages. Um, and, and really at this level, kind of the important thing is the meaning there. Right now these things have no meaning. They're just one character symbols, right? So a less than symbol in a C program, for instance, maybe it means the less than operator, right? But in HTML, it's actually the start of an HTML tag character. Uh, so you have the same character, the same maybe the same letters and the same symbols of the alphabet, but because of the, the different languages, they actually mean different things. Questions so far? Cool. Okay, so yeah, so just like in English, we're gonna create abstractions from these low level alphabet. And the abstraction we're gonna use here is analogous to the words. So in this case, we're gonna talk about tokens. And so that's when we get into, sorry, you're here. Yeah, so that's when we get into like the reserved words would be a token. Um, or something like double equals, right? So that's composed of two equal sign characters, but conceptually when you look at it and when the compiler looks at it, you know that that's actually the equality operator and not two equal signs put together, right, in C. And in C, a single equal sign by itself is assignment, right? So those are actually, two completely separate ideas, equality and assignment, and yet there's a one character difference between them, which can lead to problems if you're not careful. Um, some other things, like less than or equal, right? So this is also you know, two characters, one token. Um, so while, this is what we talked about, oh, uh, you yeah, move to one side of the projector. Uh, so like while in a lot of language is a lot of languages is a reserved keyword, right? So you can't name a variable while, um, but you can, while is thought of as a token, the token while, uh, if as well. So what we're gonna learn about is how do we precisely define these patterns? How do we specify a pattern that says, this is the exact token that I'm talking about, right? So, so for some of these things, it's pretty easy. So for double equals, what would the pattern be, like the equality operator? Uh, if, a, if a certain character of a common American is followed by the exact same one, in this case be equals, then it, it then it's taken, it performs this operation rather than simply reading equals equals. Yeah, so very good, a little bit in depth, uh, I like it. So yeah, two characters, so you have two, the bytes, the ASCII characters for two equal signs next to each other means the token equality operator, or whatever the language wants to call it. And this case stage, we don't even care what it, what it actually does later on, because now we're just worried about taking those two characters, which don't mean anything, and turning them into a, a, the token equality operator, which does mean something. Um, so yeah, so for these examples, right, it's pretty clear. But what about something like an identifier? So an identifier would be like a variable name or a function name, right? Those aren't something that we just specify, ah, it's exactly these two characters right after each other, right? So we actually have to have some way to define and express this is exactly what an identifier or a variable name can look like. Um, okay, so we're gonna formalize this Slightly, just because it's going to be easier to talk about things. Um, so, think about the symbol. Like, so we're going to actually define what a string is. I don't know if that's ever ever thought about that before, but uh, the way we're going to define it is alphabet symbols in a sequence, right? So, uh, whatever alphabet we're talking about depends on the specific programming language, and we're going to put two of those or more, or one or more characters together. Sorry, alphabet symbols together to make a string. Um, so really the important thing here is that a string over an alphabet is finite. So here we're gonna represent the alphabet as the large sigma character. Um, and so we're saying that a string is a sequence of these characters. And so there's a couple of important things here. One, they're gonna be very familiar with. Uh, epsilon, so epsilon is going to represent the empty string which means a sequence of characters with length zero, 
right? So, um, so I'm trying to think if you can think about that in a programming language context, it may mess you up, but um, so if it's, so epsilon is going to represent this empty string. So what if you concatenate a string s with epsilon? Then you get s. You get s, right, exactly. So a uh, very simple concept, but this is where we start at the very bottom to define this of what precisely we're me we mean when we talk about strings, and then we're going to build up to talk about uh, how to uh, parse and understand tokens from the raw symbols. So, uh, so yeah, so we have this equality, right? So epsilon either before or after s concatenated together, so that's what these two symbols next to each other means, is the same thing as talking about just s. And so in our examples, we're going to be talking about reg uh, so we're talking about patterns. There will be regular expressions. We're going to be talking about strings and to see if those regular expressions or those patterns match those strings. Uh, so to kind of keep this distinct and separate, I've tried that every time we talk about a string, we're going to put it in either double quotes or italic and dark blue. Let's see, does this dark blue come out in the back? So it's also italic just in case colorblind color issues. Um, so obviously this may be trivial, but just so that we're clear, right? So the double quotes in that string, in between double quotes, the double quotes are not part of that string, right? Correct? So they're just delimiting the beginning and end of that string. Any questions on strings? OK. So now we're going to move up from strings, and we're talking about collections of strings. So we're going to talk about a language. Um, so, once again, reiterating, so sigma is going to represent the set of all symbols in an alphabet, right? So that's, that's our alphabet. Is it finite or infinite? Finite. Finite, right? It would be very difficult to write in any language where you can invent new symbols and just pull out new things, right? So, uh, yes. So the alphabet needs to be finite. So what we're going to do is we're going to define sigma star as the set of all possible strings that can be constructed from our alphabet. So, so sigma star is a set, and it has all the strings that can ever be created by combining any of the symbols in our alphabet into a string with no length restrictions or anything. So does that make sense? So yeah, so this is basically like if you put the infinite number of monkeys typing on a keyboard that had, the keyboard has the symbols all in, in what was that, sigma? Actually, maybe I, hmm. I think at some point, right, they will type all those characters, all of the strings in sigma star, but that may not be true for the weird infinity things, but so way to think about it, right? So it's all possible things that could ever be typed or created or whatever from sigma star, from the characters in sigma. Okay. Yes. Does that make sigma star finite or or functionally infinite? What do you think? I'm thinking functionally infinite because if they can be if the strings have no constraint on their length. So yeah. So what what's the difference then? Or okay. So you're saying finite or infinite, right? Yes. So yeah. So you. So what does everybody else think? <laughs> infinite. Why? Right, yeah, so the big thing is the length, right? So yeah, that was exactly what you brought up in your question, right? So, um, so even though the, the alphabet that we're drawing from is finite, right, a limited amount, but you can always add one more character to the end of whatever your biggest string was in sigma star, and that string is also in sigma star, right? So you can keep creating infinite length strings. So what we want to define, so here when we're talking about a language, right, so okay, so we have this set of all possible things that could ever be written given these characters or these, these symbols. So we're going to define a language L is a, uh, is a set of strings over, yeah, okay, so uh, I like this definition actually better. Uh, so we're going to define a language as some subset of this huge infinite any possible string set, right? Which Makes sense. So there's an, you think there's an infinite number of ways you could 
type every possible character in the English alphabet, but not all of those, send, those strings that you're going to generate are going to be English strings, right? So the set of the English language is actually a smaller subset of that crazy huge infinite set. So, yeah? Uh, it's coming up, so good, good act. Um, good question. Uh, actually, I don't know if it's coming up, but yes, the answer is yes. So, uh, epsilon, the empty string, is a part of sigma star. All right, we'll see. Okay, so we already talked about this. So, is uh, sigma infinite? Alphabet? No, exactly. Sigma star infinite? Yes. Yes, by definition. Uh, is L infinite? Yes. No. Yes, it is. That's your subset. It's on the subset. All right. Wait. You want to? So, what do you say? Okay. Let's go up here first. And then we'll you take any subset. The subset must be finite. You can't. What is something else? Unless there? it's uncountably infinite, sigma star. But I don't think it is. Uh, let's go in the back on the stair step. There's a lot of seats, man. If you want a seat. L is maybe. L is maybe infinite depending on the language. What do you think? Let's have a poll. Well, oh, wait, let's go one more. Some more input. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so there's a case where you have two, you have an infinite set that's a subset of another infinite set, right? So you have the set of all numbers. Well, okay, set of all. You could do it anyways, right? So the set of all numbers greater than two, right? There's an infinite number of numbers there. But the set of all numbers greater than three is a subset of that because it doesn't include two, but it's still infinite. So, yes. So, is it yes? Is it no? We don't really have a whole lot of information about like no. I would say not enough to determine yay or nay. Yeah, so that's exactly, that's a good way to look at it, right? So you look at what's here, well, no, like there's no constraints. All we're saying is L is a subset of sigma star. So it could be, I, we could have a language that had five strings in it, right? And that could be a language, the language is, fini is finite. Um, or we can have a language like, so, I mean, like English, right? You can have, you can keep making sentences longer. Oh, I wish I had this example. So there's an example of the sentence, you make an infinite length sentence using the word buffalo. And you can keep, has anyone seen this? Okay, next class. Yeah, you can keep adding buffalo and each buffalo means something like the place buffalo or the animal buffalo. Buffalo is also plural. Um, so it can keep going infinitely. So you can have, even in language, with one word, buffalo, you can have an infinite string so that language would be infinite, so yeah which is kind of nice, so it means that you can write a lot of programs and you'll never run out. Yeah. Why would that make that language infinite? Because that's just an infinite sentence. So that doesn't mean that the language is infinite. So the sentence contains the set of all strings in a language. Right? So L contains the set of all strings. So the way we're thinking about L, right? So as we define it, it's just a subset of sigma star. But the, the meaning behind it is it's a language that we care about. So like, if you think of the English language, right? So L star has every, let's say, every string that we would consider an English sentence. Let's keep it at the sentence level, right? But there is no bound to the length of an English sentence. You can continually add in clauses at the end and make it infinitely long. So um, all of the, that string and all of those substrings are in that L set, which means that it's, Infinitely big. Any other questions? Does that make sense? Kind of. It's a little weird. It's not. I mean, it's not critical, but it's kind of cool to think about. Yeah. This white space. Is white space, so there's also, okay, there is another thing I just thought of. So there is like the, the physical language constraints. There may actually be a limit to like the size of a C program that you, like a C file that you could possibly write just because of compiler constraints. But theoretically, there's nothing. So if you look at one C expression, right? So like one plus one, 
you can always add a plus one to the end there and keep on making a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger string forever. Um, so the white space example, I believe, is the same because you could just add computations to the end and the, the program can grow infinitely. There's no bound to how large that program could be. And it's still a white space program. It's in the white space language. All right, so that brings us to regular expressions. So before we kind of dive in here, I want to pull the room to see what, who has experience using regular expressions in programming a good amount. Is it from class or from outside of class stuff? Outside of class. Outside of class, cool, awesome. Okay, so what we're gonna learn here is regular expressions from a kind of a more fundamental approach. Uh, and they're gonna be less powerful than the regular expressions that maybe you're used to using in JavaScript, Ruby, Python, whatever language. So try and kind of like uh, empty your mind of your prior knowledge, but keep it close by so you can refer to it. But uh, if, you, if you look at these and assume that these work exactly the way the regular expressions you're used to using work, uh, there's gonna be some, you're gonna have problems. Does that make sense? But the concepts map very closely. Okay, so we're actually gonna use regular expressions to define the token of our language. And we actually run into, so I'll get to that in the next slide. So we really like regular expressions in a lot of computer science. They're pretty compact. Uh, we're gonna use a regular expression to define a language, as we'll see. So we can define this infinite set of strings with a finite representation. Uh, they're fairly expressive, so we can actually express some pretty complicated, interesting things here. They're precise, so this is very important for this class. So when you give me a regular expression, I know exactly what strings it matches, what it doesn't match, what language it describes, and the same vice versa. So there's no ambiguity there of, well, yeah. Uh, also widely used, so that's the other cool. So you saw all your classmates using regular expressions, they come up a lot in programming, so it's a good tool to have in your toolkit. Um, and the other thing, so it's very, so we're not gonna get into the specifics, um, but it's very easy to generate an efficient program that matches a given regular expression. So you give me a regular expression, I, or obviously the computer can create a program that can efficiently match any text input and look for that regular expression. Uh, I wasn't gonna go into the details, but how familiar is everybody with like, NFAs, DFAs, some, what class is that from? 355, and that's not required for this class. No, because it has a higher number. Okay. Uh, so that's one, one good reason. Uh, okay, yeah, so when you get to that class, uh, so for people that do have the background, I'll just briefly mention, so that a regular expression, you can easily and precisely transform that into an NFA that you can use to match uh, text. So that's why it's very efficient and pretty awesome. Questions? Okay, here's where we run into, I, I don't know if, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a big nerd, but I always really like when I ever find like a recursion loop in real life. Uh, so here we actually have to define the syntax of regular expressions when we're here trying to learn how to define and how to analyze syntax. Right, so that's kind of awesome. So we're gonna do it, not informally, we're gonna be very precise about what we mean, but uh, just so we're clear, this is what we're defining. We're gonna define the syntax. Right now we're gonna define what a regular expression looks like. And so hopefully this helps maybe later when we talk about, okay, syntax semantics, you can think, oh yeah, regular expression. So the syntax means, just looks like this, and the semantics is the meaning behind what those, uh, what, what those operators, what that, uh, that meaning is. Okay. So a regular expression is either uh, the empty set, epsilon, and now one thing you'll notice, right? These are not within double quotes, they're not italic and dark blue, so these are regular expressions we're talking about here. Uh, so A is a regular expression where A is an element of the alphabet sigma. Uh, R1 bar R2 uh, where R1 and R2 are regular expressions. R1 dot R2, 
where R1 and R2 are regular expressions. Uh, parentheses R, where R is a regular expression. And R star, where R is a regular expression. Yeah? Uh, I think we're going to get to it in just a second. Uh, so the empty set is a set that, so yeah, we'll get there in a second. So hold that thought. Yeah? Can we also use the dagger if you want? Uh, no. So yeah, so there's other, so I actually, I believe if you look at the book, I've actually changed the, um, the usage that they use in the book. So they actually use the, the dagger, the plus sign for uh, the, the bar in this example. Um, but that's, this is actually how most regular expression implementations that you use in a programming language operate. So that's why I've decided to kind of shift it over here. Um, it does create slight problems when we talk about parsing, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, and I don't think it'll be a huge issue. Other questions? So just to kind of be clear, so at this stage, right, we're just defining what a regular expression looks like. So if I give you any random string, right, I say, is this a regular expression? You'll kind of know it'll either follow these patterns or it won't. Okay, but the real question is, what does this mean, right? Because right now it's just a bunch of notation. Okay, so what we want to do, a regular expression defines a language. So this is going to be, a language is, right, uh, a set of strings that are a subset of all possible strings in the alphabet. Um, so the regular expression is going to define a language. And, and so uh, this is how we figure out what the language is based on the regular expression. So this is going to give semantic meaning to what it means to, when we see that syntax, what does that actually mean? Uh, so the language described by the regular expression of the empty set is the empty set. Um, the regular expression, so the language, so I did do it here, okay, good. Uh, the language defined by the regular expression epsilon is the set containing epsilon. So here's where we get into the difference. Where is it back up there? Got that question? So you? Somebody? Nobody remembers asking that like five seconds ago? Is it you? Here? All right, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, okay, so the point is, the difference here, right, is that, um, so the language described by the regular expression epsilon matches the, sh the empty string, epsilon, right? So that's why, in this example, the set, right, so the curly braces denote set. So the language described by the regular expression epsilon is the set containing the empty string, right? So that will, so that will match epsilon, the empty string, whereas uh, an empty, right, the empty set regular expression matches nothing. So that set is, has nothing in it, yeah. The given population of the language represented by the null set, is that one or is that zero? Is the length? Plus, like, the population. Of my, my the guess cardinality of the set? How many things are inside the language represented by the null set? Ah, uh, zero. So I actually have a better example later. But yeah, it's basically two braces. So left brace, right brace, right. so nothing in the set. So the cardinality of that set is zero, whereas the cardinality of the set containing the empty string is one. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So. We build up a little bit more. Okay, so the language described by a regular expression that is one character, right, or one symbol from our alphabet is the set containing the string of that symbol. Okay, does this make sense so far? It almost seems too easy, right? No? Um, and so that's why, so just once again, I'm, I'm going to make sure we're very clear. So on the left, right, is on the left, right. On the left is the regular expression A, and on the right is the set containing the string A. So two separate things. Okay, so now we're going to get into the actual operators. Um, so the language described by regular expression one, bar, regular expression two, 
is the language described by regular expression one union with the language described by regular expression two. So can somebody briefly summarize set union? Not like formally, just it's kind of important. Uh, you already talked, let's go over here. Come on this side, yeah. Yeah, anything that's in that, you put the two of them together and sets, it doesn't matter if there's more than one element, right? So you just put the two sets together. So yeah, union, very simple. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing right here, right? So the bar symbol by itself doesn't mean anything. All it means is that uh, we can, when we see the bar, we know exactly how to operate here. We can replace R1 bar R2 with the language described by R1 union the language described by R2, and then we follow all the rest of the rules. So then we can say if that was, let's say, A as R1, we would replace L of A with the set containing A. And if R2 was B, the regular expression B, we would replace L, B with the set containing B, take the union, and that result would be the set containing A and B. So you know, that's a very long way of saying, in a second, it should be very clear semantically what it means and why we've chosen the bar symbol, the bar character. Uh, but for our purposes, it could, be, it could be any character, right? So that's kind of cool. That's, like, that's what we're learning about in doing this class is how to actually define our symbols and give them meaning, essentially. Questions? OK, so then the dot operator. So this is where slightly, OK, so we're going to, so L1, so you can see this is not a recursive definition, but very close. Uh, so the language described by R1 dot R2, the regular expression R1 dot R2, is equal to uh, the language described by R1 dot the language described by R2. So right now, yeah, that's very ambiguous. So we're going to define that formally later. But uh, we're first going to go and give an example of the bar operation. So this is, so at the top is the, uh, the definition, right? So the language described by R1 bar R2 is the language described by R1 union with the language described by R2. And one thing maybe you want to do in your mind that maybe you haven't thought about yet is you kind of want to type check this equation, right? So if you think of kind of L as a function, well, it takes in a regular expression and it returns a set of strings. So here we have, so we have L, LR1 is going to return a set of strings. Union with LR2 is going to return a set of strings. That union is a set of strings. So everything type checks. Okay, cool. Or not. OK. So let's look through some examples. So it's, we're going to break this down. So we're going to have, OK, the language of A bar B. So A bar B is what? A regular expression? A bar B is a regular expression, right? I just want to get there. So a bar B is a regular expression. So what's going to be on the right side of this equation? Almost. First step. The very first step. I'm applying the rule at top, right? So we're just going to substitute. Exactly. We're going to substitute in A for R1, B for R2. And we're going to get LA union LB. And then we're going to apply the other rule, right? So what's the language described by A? Set A and the language described by B. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, the language described by A. So now you can see here, uh, it's the set containing the string A and the set containing the string B. And when we union those together, the set containing A and B. Exactly. Cool. OK. This goes vaguely more complicated. So the set containing, or the language, described by the regular expression of A bar B bar C. So applying the first rule at top once, right? we're going to get the language described by A or B, union the language described by C. So does everybody see that, that A bar B is a regular expression? In this case, it's, regular, it's R1 in the example on top. And so we know from above that the language described by the regular expression A bar B is uh, the set containing the strings A and B, right? And so we will replace that there with the language uh, described by the regular expression C. 
set containing C. Well, yeah, then we union those together, so we add C to this set. Right? And now we've got a nice, uh, nice set there. So, so semantically, so let's go back to that original question. I think, oh, you know, we'll con continue for a little bit. Uh, okay, so now let's do this. So the language described by A or epsilon. So we're going to first apply the, the rule on top, right? Just separate it and say it's the language described by the regular expression A union with the language described by the regular expression epsilon. So what is that? Right, the set containing the string A, union the set containing the string epsilon, and then when we union those together, what does that set? So we're going to raise our hand for this one. Uh, let's go here. Set A. Set A. Is that right? I'm going to say no. I don't know what. That's not, that's not right. So it's epsilon comma A. It's epsilon comma A. So that. Epsilon comma A. Right. So. So yeah, so that's that's kind of where you're getting to that epsilon empty set distinction, right? So, so if it was empty set, it would just be A. Exactly. If it was empty set, it would be just A. So yeah, that's important to, to remember because um, here we're saying the language of A bar epsilon is the set matches the set containing A or the empty string. So it'll match either empty string or A. Okay, what about this one? You want to go right to the end, tell me what that set is? Yeah. Epsilon. epsilon, yeah. So the set containing epsilon. Perfect. OK, and we already talked about this, but this kind of gets into it. So the set containing epsilon is not equal to an empty set. OK, so what, now that we've gone through these examples, maybe in excruciating, excruciating detail, uh, what, what, how would you describe the semantics of this bar operator? Uh, some, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, it's essentially a, like a Venn diagram that you have A, you have a circle of A, you have a circle of B, and then you, you just have everything colored in in this case. E. Okay. How would you describe that in one word? Just Am? Or. 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 Uh, or. <laughs> but yeah, no. Actually, no, that makes sense. Or. <laughs> yes. And okay. would be intersection. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's and, I mean, so you're thinking about sets, right? So you're thinking two sets together, I want both of them. So you're thinking union kind of and, but uh, really when you think about it semantically, when I say A bar B, what I really mean is I want to match either A or B, right? So the string A or the string B. Does that make sense? So that's why, that's why the bar, I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's why uh, actual implementations of regular expression use the bar because when I see it, I read it kind of as or to myself. Questions on this operator? All right, now we have to dig into this dot operator. So this is definitely a bit of a cop out, right? So here we're saying, okay, this is the definition, and then we're introducing a new dot operator between two sets, right? Uh, so now we actually have to define that. What does it mean for one set dot another set, right? And this is Maybe another time where that programming language type mindset can come in. So this, within the L on the left is R1 dot R2. That whole thing is a regular expression. So the dot in there is a regular expression. Here this dot operator is operating on what? Sets. Sets of, of what? Strings. strings, yeah, sets of strings. I heard sets of Sets of strings, right, exactly. So this dot operator we're going to define on sets of strings. So for two sets A and B of strings, we're going to define A dot B as the set containing X, Y, where X, Y next to each other right here is we're talking string concatenation. So X concatenated with Y for all X in the set A and for all Y in the set B. Does that make sense? So maybe, well, let's go through some examples to kind of, because this is um, mathematical notation here takes a while 
maybe to get used to. Um, OK, so an example. We have a set A containing two A's and B, and set B containing the string AB. So what is A dot B? So first, first thing to think about, how many elements are in the set A dot B? Four. OK, so I guess what are those four strings? Anybody want to take a stab? You want to raise their hand? Somebody who hasn't spoken yet? Good. Okay, I think it's A A A A A B B A and B. Is he right? Yeah. You sure. So you just mess people up. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so there's four, right? So you're gonna take every element in A and append every element in B to it, and those are new elements in the set A dot B. So you take A A, right? You're going to concatenate the string A with it from the set B. That's the first element. The second element is AA concatenated with the second element of B, which is AAB. And then you're going to take the second element of A, concatenate it with the first element of B, which is BA. And then you're going to take the second element of A, concatenate it with the second element of B to get BB. Does that make sense? And does everybody see how this follows exactly from that definition? All right, so is AB an element? Wow, I'm not sure why I put this here because that's very confusing with the example up there. Um, so AB should hopefully clearly not be in A dot B, right? Well, A, we've defined what A dot B is. We've written out the entire set. Um, so that should be very clear. Uh, the other reason is we, we're not we're not uh, concatenating anything within B with itself, right? So we don't concatenate the A and the B within B. Uh, that may be the one way you can get A, B. OK. So what about this? A, B, epsilon in A, and A and B in B. So how many elements is this going to have? Six. Six. Take a vote. I like this. Wisdom of the crowds. I should like record this as data and write a paper. Um, four? Who thinks four? Who thinks five? Six? Seven? Eight? No? Maybe? One person? Is it great? Okay. So does somebody want to go with whatever they think it is? Let's go back there. Wait, it was AB. A, B. Oh, I was pointing to him. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. I started to look at the answer so I could. So I could. Sorry. Uh, next one. Next one. You better be ready. All right. OK. Yeah, so this is AAA. A, A, right? So the two A's in A concatenated with the first A and B. AAB, B A, B B. And A and B. So why the last A and B? Epsilon. epsilon. Epsilon, right, exactly. So because of the epsilon. So we're taking the epsilon from A, we're concatenating epsilon and the string A from B, and that is just A, right? We talked about that not a half hour ago. Um, so does that make sense? And does everybody see why there's no epsilon in A dot B? It's the empty string, yes. So what? But so there's an epsilon in A, right? But there's no epsilon in A dot B. Why? There's no epsilon in B. Only the epsilon in B. Right. So there's no epsilon in B. So we're essentially, you can think of it. So the way I like to think about this is string concatenation of those two sets, right? So we're concatenating everything that A describes and concatenating everything that B describes. So the prefix of this string has to match something in A. So only if epsilon is both in A and B can you get epsilon in AB. Because if you can cat two epsilons together, it's going to be epsilon. Um, but because there's no epsilon in B, right, you're always going to have something at the end of this string when you do A dot B. Does that make sense? Questions? No. OK. So now we've got to talk about operator preference, which is, again, one of these things where we're going to talk about it in great 
great depth later, but it's going to come up here when we talk about regular expressions. So the question is, what does this regular expression mean? A bar B dot C. So what are the options, let's say? Well, What's, oh yeah, yeah, go here. Yeah, exactly. So exactly what I have here, right? So yeah, if you think about math operators and using parentheses, so we could mean A or B parentheses dot C or A bar B dot C. Um, so just like in math or a programming language, it's up to us. Right now, we're defining the regular expressions to define what it means when we see A bar B dot C. Because nothing in our syntax prevents this. So somebody, you, me, anyone can write this, uh, this regular expression, and I need to be able to understand exactly what language you're talking about here. Um, okay, so yeah, so just like in math, so how is this math be parsed? B times C plus A. Why? At this. Operator press. Operator press. Yeah, important. Okay. So yeah, so because of so that's the order of operations defined in math, right? We've all been we've been using that for a very long time. Um, so in math, right, it's, uh, here it is. So, right, so uh, multiplication has the higher precedence. So that means when you see A plus B times C, you know that the B and C happen together, and then whatever the result of that is, is added to A. So here, we're going to do exactly the same thing. And this is one of those things that it's all based on uh, mutual understanding and definition. So here we're going to define that the dot operator has a higher precedence than plus. Um, so that, that way, when we look at this, A or B dot C, which one of those two options are we talking about? The second one, right? So the A or parentheses B dot C. When you say plus, do you mean bar or? Ah, that's a good point. Uh, yes, or bar. This is one of those things where you say, like, I put in these errors intentionally to make sure you're awake and paying attention. And then I make a note to change it later. Okay, cool. Okay, so then now that we've established this precedence of the dot operator having a higher precedence over the bar operator, uh, how do we then interpret this? the language described by the regular expression A or B dot C. Does anyone want to go all the way to the end? How many, how many um, strings are in this set? Two. Two. What are the strings? Someone raise their hand first. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, this one thing doesn't work. Yeah. So we first, because we know that um, the dot has higher precedence, we're going to do, essentially you can think about we're doing that last. So we're going to first do the or, and we're going to say the language described by A union, the language described by B dot C, and then we calculate both of those, and we say the set containing A union the set containing the string B, C, and we union those. Yeah, there's a hand. Over here. No people scratching their head. I'm my first row. Cool. Awesome. Questions on operator preference, where we're talking about it here in regular expressions? Okay, so there's some things we haven't defined yet. So there are still, we're talking about regular expression syntax. So we've defined uh, the empty set, epsilon, uh, a single character, or single character from the alphabet. We talked about concatenation. We talked about the bar, the dot and the bar. Uh, so what do we have left? Star. Star. There's one more. Parentheses. Yeah, maybe I should swap these around. Um, so yeah, parentheses are defined very simply. So we're just going to remove the parentheses, right? Um, this just gives us the formal way to actually specify and, and say that these are what parentheses mean. Um, so that when we say something like the language described by parentheses A or B dot C, right? So the same thing, but now with the parentheses. Now we can say formally that, well, Parentheses A or B 
end parentheses, is a regular expression. So at a high level, this is regular expression dot C. Right? So we're first going to apply the dot operator and do the right language described by A or B. So this is just applying that rule at the very top here. The language described by A or B dot C. So does anybody want to tell me what this is? Yeah. A, C, B, C. Yeah. So we're going to do, so the bar operator, the language described by A or B is A comma B and dot C. So this is, so this regular expression describes the language containing the strings A, C, and B, C. Does that make sense? Yeah? So yeah, so that's kind of, so how you want to try and read these, and it takes, if you've never seen them before, it takes definitely some experience, but, uh, so when you look at this first regular expression here of parentheses a or b dot c, you can kind of think, okay, first there's going to be an a character or a b character, and then followed by, so the concatenated by a c. So you can say it's going to match a, c, b, c. So, but, you know, on homeworks and exams, it's always best if you follow all these steps, I mean, show your work, right? That way we can give you partial credit if you make a huge mistake, rather than if you just put the wrong answer, the wrong answer is wrong, so. Okay, questions on parentheses? Okay, the star, so this is called, this operator is called uh, the clean, actually I actually don't know how to pronounce it, I'm gonna say clean, the clean star. Um, so, we need to define the language described by R star. And so this is where the definition is going to be a little interesting. So, um, so I'm going to give an example first, and then we're going to define it kind of formally. So, uh, so the language described by R star is the set containing the <coughs> empty string, so the set containing the string epsilon, union with the language described by the regular expression, union with the language described by the regular expression concatenated by the language described by the regular expression, union with that thing three more times, union by that thing four more times, and so on uh, to infinity. So does that kind of make sense? So let's kind of define it more formally because this may help. So. <coughs> We can think of it as a recursive definition. So we have L0, right? The base case here is L with a superscript 0 of R we're defining as epsilon. And then, like we do when we're trying to define things recursively, we say, okay, so we've defined our base case. And then we say, what do we do for any arbitrary I case? So the language described by uh, the regular expression with the I superscript is equal to the language described by, yeah, okay, the language described by i minus one, so the last one, dot the language described by r. So, does everybody see that the languages with the superscript, the L with the superscript, is going to get expanded out all the way to zero? So, for any i you give me, I can just do this, right? I can expand it out that many times. And L0 is going to be this, the empty, the set containing the empty string. And all of those LRs, uh, it's just going to be a, a length of that. Everybody see that? Doesn't that be LI? Uh, so if you give me an LI, if you give me a specific I, I will, yeah, so that will be uh, L0R, which is the empty set dot LR dot LR dot LR dot LR uh, I times. And then so here we now can, we can formally define the language described by L star using this superscript notation. As we say, it's the union of all the i's from 0 to infinity, all the i's greater than or equal to 0. Um, and this should be like the i's greater than or equal to 0 under the union, but PowerPoint doesn't really do that very nice. So, um, but it's, I think it's fairly clear of the li's union R, right? So the question you should ask yourself is, does this definition match up with this example up here? Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly? <laughs> so, whose base, what base? Yeah, yeah, this is what this means. 
that's what so that's what I'm saying. So the, the it's one of those uh, syntax things, right? So um, we're saying this is implied. So basically, we're union unioning everything starting from i is equal to zero all the way to infinity. Uh, all those unions of L of that i. So the union of L superscript r or L superscript zero of r, the union with L superscript one of r, the union with L superscript two of r, and so on infinity. Uh, but the question is, does this match this example here? Why or why not? So obviously, you know, I'm not going to write out the infinite thing, but the triple, but the ellipses there imply infinity. So does anybody disagree? Think that it doesn't match? Some people not sure, unsure of what the question is. Let's look at some examples. I think that'll help. Okay. So the rule is we're going to union all of these L superscript of I's starting from zero all the way to infinity. So, so it maybe is clear, maybe it's not clear. So L R star, that language described by R star, is it finite or infinite? Infinite. Is it definitely infinite? No. It depends on the language. No. Uh, it depends on the language. Uh, I say, so we're talking about a language. So we're talking about L, L of R star. Right? So it depends on the regular expression, right? So I think there may be only one case that it's finite, maybe more, but um, so we'll talk about that in a second. But in most cases, it's going to be infinite, right? An infinite set. So we're not going to be able to write it out exactly like we were able to write out before. So the language described by a bar b star, so what is that going to be? So let's first take the, the bar, right? So here we're going to say that, excuse me, uh, that the star is going to bind very tightly as far as operator preference, right? So it's going to apply to the closest regular expression. So it's not going to be A or B star. We have to write that with parentheses. So let's take it. So the or, right, the or, or the, the bar operator splits this into the language described by A, union with the language described by B star, right? OK, so what's the language described by A? A. A. Great. So what's the language described by B star? Does anybody want to start off? Yeah. Yeah. So wait, I think you said empty set? I think empty string. Empty string, sorry. Yeah, perfect. Okay, epsilon. Or is it epsilon and empty kind of start the same, so I understand. Uh, yeah, so so we're gonna have A, the string A, which comes from the bar operator, right? The language described by the regular expression A. And then we have epsilon, and then we have B, 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 B and keep going, right? You can always add one more B to any string. So any string that is all Bs is within this set. So everybody see how this set is definitely infinite, but we all, but it's still described by this regular expression, right? So if I give you any string, I can say, does this, is this regular expression in this language? <coughs> or is this, is this string inside the language described by this regular expression? And that's what we mean by matching. Right, so I can give you any string, you'll be able to tell me yes or no. Right, because you can say, well, it's either A, it's going to be the empty string, or it's all these. And it's either in that language or it's not in that language. Does that make sense? OK, let's look at What about this? So A or B star. What's the first thing in this set? <coughs> Epsilon, yeah, exactly. So we have first, so remember the, the L superscript zero of R is the second containing epsilon. So anytime you see an R, that there's, I mean, every time you see a star, there's always going to be an epsilon there. So what's that going to be uh, union with? A, what was it? Say that louder. You said it. Huh? A and B. A and B, yeah, so the second containing A and B. Yeah, so. 
That would be L1, right? The second chaining A and B. Uh, what about the next one? This is where it gets tricky. Uh, you guys go on. Go somewhere else. Somewhere in this direction. I can call on people. So yeah, so what we're doing here, right, is we're taking, we're taking um, the language described by A or B dot the language described by A or B, and that is A, 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 B, B, A, B, B, right? So you can also think of, um, and then, so what about the next one? Anybody want to tackle the next one? Go more this way. You were kind of in the middle, but you kind of still not off the hook. Raise your hand. Yeah. You went in a weird order, man. <laughs> I, think you, I think you got it, yes. So, yeah, so then it's all the strings of like three that are. A, the, the set AB dot the set AB dot the set AB, right? So it's all possible combinations. So you can also think of it as all strings of length three composed only of A's and B's. And so this other dot is going to be all strings of length four that are composed of A's and B's. And the same thing with the next row, right? Will be all strings of length five composed only of A's and B's. And so hopefully you can see that again, even though this set is infinite, there's an infinite number of strings, right? I can only do like three or four rows here. But still, if you gave me a string or I give you a string, you can say, is it in this set? Right? So if I give you the string ABC, is it in this set? No. No. Why? Because C is not in the set. C is not in the set, exactly. But if I gave you the string, I don't know, A, B, A, B, A, B, 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 A, right? It doesn't really matter what I say as long as I don't say anything that's not an A or B. Yeah. So what, the, what, what this language is describing is all possible combinations of A and B along with An B infinite number of times, exactly. Yeah, so it also depends on our, um, it depends on our alphabet, right? So this, if our alphabet is only A's and B's, this could be the set sigma star, not that it really matters, but maybe to think about it, um, right? This could be every possible string in our language um, if A and B are all the symbols in our language. So it would describe binary. That, that would be R star binary. Yeah. 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 But if you're talking about uh, the language of, let's say our symbols are the alphabet, the lowercase alphabet, right? Then this just matches any string that only contains A's or B's in no particular order. So we don't care about the order or anything. But as long as it's either all A's or all B's or nothing, <laughs> that's the other important thing. Questions? So I kind of think about it, yeah. So that means the green star is like the infinite set, right? The language over the green star as a infinite set. So that means the language is that it's infinite every time? I would say not every time. I think if I think if you do have the language described by epsilon star, it's just epsilon. Right? Because no matter how many times you do that, you're only ever adding epsilon. Uh, so it's the set containing epsilon. So I think in that one case it's finite, but I think for every other case it's infinite. But don't ask me to prove it like right now. More questions? This L of zero bar one star the whole binary Is L of one zero star yeah, so that kind of goes to this point. So yeah, it all depends on what you pose as symbols, right? So here if we just substitute in A is one and B is zero then this describes every possible binary number. Yeah? What happens when you combine the empty set and all these, uh, these operations? What happens, when you uh, what happens when you combine the empty set? Um, I th so the short answer is it'll probably never come up. But maybe. Uh, it just means that, so for all these operators, right, it just doesn't do anything. So, like, Except maybe for star. I think maybe the star of the empty set star would maybe be epsilon by definition. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, but I think for all the other ones, it just is like, uh, so if it's A or the empty set, it's A. More questions? Cool, all right, let's talk.
quickly about tokens. We've got like five more minutes. Um, oh, whoa, whoa. still got time. All right, so what we really want to do, so we're going to use, so now we've covered regular expressions. We want to define tokens using these regular expressions. So we're going to do things like, so we want to define a letter generally, right? So in English, how would we define a letter? Kind of by a regular expression. Does anybody want to do the super verbose? So just a letter, just one length one. Let's say the alphabet is like all printable ASCII characters. You want a letter. So I guess or. Take a shot. Yeah. It's one of it's it's one of fifty-two specific characters. Upper upper and lower case. Uh, with what in between them? That. With what in between them in the regular expression with the syntax that we talked about? Uh, well, that just single letters. What was it? Bars. Bars. Yeah, bars. So, yeah. So we just we have all the characters we care about. Each of a single character is a regular expression. We're going to put bars between them all. So now we say a letter <coughs> is a regular expression defined by A or B or C, lowercase a or lowercase b or lowercase c, all the way to uppercase a, uppercase b, and so on. Uh, a digit, a digit. <coughs> Same thing with 0 through 9, exactly. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So some people who uh, maybe are already familiar with regular expressions where they have the bracket syntax that you can specify a character class, this is, you don't need that, right? You can build that with this. Um, okay, so what, somebody wanna, what is the rule for an identifier, let's say specifically a variable, but we'll call it an identifier in C. So what is like the regular, how would you write a token from what you know about C about how that works. So without white space, we're not going to consider white space right now. We'll go somewhere else. Yeah? Starts with a letter or an underscore, and then letters, underscores, and things like that. Perfect, yeah. So that actually messes up my example, so I forgot about that. But yeah, so, um, so I just have a letter as first, but yeah, I forgot you could start with definitely an underscore. Uh, you can't start with a number, though. It's actually, if you've programmed a language that allows that, it actually can be kind of, can be nice sometimes. Um, so this is kind of the syntax for a regular expression that defines an identifier in C. But you'll notice that I did some cheating here. So what am I forgetting here? So is this a regular expression based on what we've seen so far? No, no, why? Yeah, yeah no concatenation, right? So this is where we say that since we're all very, we've got, we've got all this thing down, we're gonna cheat like in math and take a shortcut. And just like you don't always write x uh, star y when you mean x multiplied by y, uh, we're gonna say xy and you know that that means multiplication, right? So same thing here in regular expressions, which makes sense if you think about the definition, right? The definition is concatenation. So if I put two characters together, then that means, so you think about the regular expression foo matches the string foo because it's foo f dot o dot o. Yeah? Um, do you have to exclude the y over if in that regular expression as well? Uh, it depends is the long answer. Yes. It depends on the language and how you do it. Uh, you can ask me that question on Wednesday or oh, is it Monday? On Monday and we'll probably get there. Um, okay, so let's Okay, so question, does this match that regular expression? Yes. Self-check. Yes. Yes? Why? Starts with a letter and it follows by zero or more letters, digits, or underscore. What about this one? No. No. Very good. Okay, see you guys on Monday.